very much for being here, everyone. Welcome to our Letters and Arts uh, series event for today. Uh, we have the novelist Susan Marshall. Uh, I will call upon uh, my colleague here to introduce her. Never met her. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Susan Marshall is visiting us today from Toronto, where she lives and where she writes. Um, but she did her undergraduate studies here at Western in London, and so that was one of the reasons why she decided to set her first novel, Nemesis, in London, Ontario. So the book is actually set here. Um, so uh, I guess maybe you could say that um, Susan comes to books naturally because, uh, well, she's... Have, uh, a background as a history major, doing a lot of reading and research there, and uh, also a master of library science, and uh, and uh, quite an, a voracious reader as well, belonging to several book clubs and all that kind of thing. Um, but uh, they say, I guess, that truth is stranger than fiction. So um, you know, a lot of unusual real life events can. Uh, sometimes perhaps provide a bit of a prerequisite to uh, being an author um, and so I guess you know starting off with being the mother of twins for example um, there you go um, and uh, so Sue is um, actually the mother of uh, four children and so I guess the young adult novel or the young adult, adult genre uh, might provide a bit of a natural fit I guess Anybody can perhaps identify with the characters in a young adult novel because we've all passed through that chapter of our lives, um, as long as we haven't managed to block it from our memory permanently. Um, but in Sue's case, four of her, three of her four children have already passed through that stage of life, so uh, hopefully that would provide uh, some extra insights and some content. Um, and uh, anyway, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Sue. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I have never been to Fanshawe before, and it's great to be here. I've heard so many good things about it from my sister, Corrine. And um, I worked at Seneca College for a number of years in Toronto, and so I'm quite familiar with community colleges and the people in the program, so it kind of feels a bit like home being here. Um, as Kareem mentioned, a fun fact about Nemesis is that it's set in London, Ontario. And there's this old adage that writers write what they know, which is to a certain extent true. And as Kareem can attest, I'm geographically challenged, so I had to write where I knew. So it was just very important for me to pick a setting that I had some familiarity with. And um, I went to, I grew up in Hamilton. And I moved to London and I did four years uh, of history at King's College. And then I went right from King's uh, to the University of Toronto where I did a master's in library science. And I basically have not left Toronto since I arrived there um, as a student. And, you know, Nemesis is one of those books where a setting is always important in a book. Um, and I, but I didn't quite have a setting in mind until I was partway through the book. Um, you know, a big theme of Nemesis, and we'll get into it in a little bit, is social isolation. Um, the protagonist is friendless, and I just, you know, Toronto would have made more sense in some ways just because I was physically there, but I just felt like the theme of social isolation is just more amplified in a large and personal city, and I just did not want to have my protagonist there. So it came between Hamilton and London, and, uh, you know, um, Hamilton just has baggage, it has a big personality, and I just, I just didn't feel like the right fit. Um, I, I love, uh, I know every city has edginess and edges to them, but I just felt like London was just the right size, had the right feel, was a more relatable place, and uh, I could just see my protagonist, Nadine, living here with her family. Um, and um, I also kind of like the idea that, you know, some parts of London just seem picture perfect as you're walking through them, these beautiful sub suburbs, subdivisions. And I like the idea that behind closed doors there were some not nice things happening. You know, anyway, so I just wanted to, to mention that that's why I chose London. I have a few little slides here, just have to listen to me all the time. Am I right clicking? Just click. Oh, just mm -hmm. click. Oops, next. Okay. <laughs> 
So as a librarian, you know, to me, um, public library is always representative of a town. So, nemesis. So the theme of nemesis is your sis is your nemesis. It's about sisters who don't get along. And um, people always say, how did you come up with that idea? Well, um, Karina and I had two other sisters. And so there were four girls in total in our family. And, you know, I'm very familiar with sister dynamics, the good and the bad. And sometimes the behavior amongst us crossed the line into bad behavior, into bullying, quasi-bullying. Um, but we were lucky enough to have parents who were present and who were able to sort of step in and referee and make sure things didn't get out of hand. And I just, you know, was thinking, huh, I wonder what would happen if you had, you know, a sibling who had sort of bullying tendencies and another sibling who was more of a placator, more of a pleaser. And you put them in a family and then you stir in a meltdown. So in this particular uh, situation, the father has physically left the family within the last year, and the mother um, has had an emotional meltdown as a result, and both parents are not present. And so it's really, you know, sort of Lord of the Flies in some ways, where these two sisters are on their own in this house, and that's how um, the story begins. And so the idea is your sis as your nemesis. And I know that not everybody has read the book, um, and so there's a synopsis I'll just quickly go over. So um, dad has moved out and mom has checked out, leaving the door wide open for the beautiful erratic Rachel to torment her loser, loner, younger sister Nadine. With her family in full meltdown mode, Nadine is alone, trying to cope with Rachel's increasingly unpredictable moods. Friendless but determined to turn her life around, Nadine meets Anne who introduces her to field hockey and her hot twin brothers, Matt and Cameron. Now this is the key line. As Nadine's star begins to rise, however, Rachel plots to bring her back down. So Nadine really does try to turn her life around in the story, and her sister is always waiting in the wings. Uh, the tension ratchets up when Rachel starts feeling Matt, just as Nadine is getting to know Cameron better. So it's those twin brothers, Matt and Cameron. Each sister has eyes for the other twin brothers, and the twin brothers couldn't be more different in personality. Um, when Matt's interest starts to fade, Rachel goes into overdrive. And then is Nadine ready to risk it all in the final showdown with her sister? Will she be able to actually find her voice? So I don't want to read too much to you. Um, there is something called an elevator pitch in writing that I wasn't familiar with. And uh, it's actually really hard to take a whole novel and try to get it into sort of a short, snappy, compelling few sentences. And so once you finish writing a novel, you know, the, the first thing the publisher will say is, hey, we need a good elevator pitch. And um, so this is ultimately what I came up with. And, you know, the, the basic concept is sharing a bathroom with a mean girl. <laughs> so if any of you are not familiar with elevator pitches, it's just a great thing to have in your back pocket when you uh, have something that you do want to pitch to somebody. The idea is that if I found myself on an elevator with the uh, editor of Penguin Publishing, and I only had that short amount of time, a minute up an elevator, to pitch them on a book, what would I come up with? And the idea is you're supposed to have that on your fingertip, or, or in your top, tip of your tongue. I have written another book, but I haven't quite got my elevator pitch nailed. I'm, I'm still working on it. It's actually really difficult to do. I'm going to read a few passages uh, from the novel to you. And um, just to set the stage, the protagonist is Nadine. She's just started grade 10 in September. Uh, her family has sort of melted down over the past year just as she was transitioning to high school, and it didn't go well. Uh, she basically lost her friends she had from elementary school, and she starts high school, and her friends have reinvented themselves, and she's just by herself. And she's really on the shy side, definitely, and she's quite terrified to go into the cafeteria and eat lunch because she feels like she'll just be sitting by herself. And um, anyways, I do have some friends who, who shared with me situations similar with their own children, and that was something that resonated with me. So here is our protagonist. She hides in the library. And she pretends to study uh, at lunchtime. Even though it was a beautiful September day, and pretty much everyone was outside for lunch, I went up to the library again. 
As I pulled open the door, Mr. Kahn, the librarian, smiled at me, but I could see he was disappointed. I smiled back at him, but I sure didn't feel it. As the steel door closed behind me, I was enveloped in a muddy beige, the carpet and walls the exact same noise-canceling pew. Suddenly, I didn't want the dullness anymore. I wanted to be hopeful and positive. I focused on the sunny yellow polo shirt that Mr. Kong was wearing and tried to feel imaginary rays of sunshine on my face, but I couldn't make it happen. I had to do something, anything other than just existing. I was sick of sneaking lunch while pretending to study and was getting tired of feeling sorry for myself. Well, I thought, maybe I should get up and browse around. I'm surrounded by all these amazing books. Maybe I could learn something, improve myself. As I started wandering, I felt the watchful eyes of Mr. Khan tracking my progress. So nice to see you browsing. Can I help you? Are you looking for an interesting book? I'm not sure. I'm just seeing if something looks good. I did notice the Book of Awesome. I picked it up and leafed through it. A good choice, said Mr. Khan. Everyone could use more awesome in their lives. I not but thought more awesome. I had absolutely no awesome. Maybe this book was too advanced for me. <laughs> but my eyes were inexplic inexplicably drawn to a display of pamphlets on the circulation desk. I remembered from health class last year that Mrs. Anthony had told us about Alcoholics Anonymous and how it helped desperate people turn their lives around. They had this 12-step program that people could follow if they were ready to take the leap. Wasn't I a desperate person? Like an alcoholic who was ready to seek treatment, I was at rock bottom. I was a loser-holic, and I needed to pull myself up. Mr. Kahn must have noticed that I swiped the pamphlet as he appeared at my side with a furrowed look of concern. Is there a problem with a friend or a relative? You know you can talk to me or one of the guidance counselors. Thanks, but it's hard to explain. I'm wondering if you can follow a bunch of steps and somehow straighten out your life. Oh, I see, said Mr. Kahn. You mean if it's crooked? Yes, exactly, crooked. Well, I quickly realized that the 12 steps to sobriety were not easily transferable to a teenage girl looking for happiness in high school. It gave me an idea. I needed to devise my own plan to dig myself out of the hole I was in. I wasn't sure how to begin, and then it hit me. My first step would be to figure out what I wanted to change. Right away, I considered my disastrous life at home. When I was a kid, I'd always thought of our family as a tree, with my parents as the trunk and Rachel and I as the branches. But lately, our trees seemed sick, like the Asian beetle infestation we learned about in ecology. And Rachel seemed to think that spraying poison all around would somehow reverse the damage. But the truth was, it only made things worse. Our tree was too far gone. It was rotten from within. In the end, I decided that I couldn't change mom or dad or Rachel. I could only set goals for myself. So this is sort of a pivotal moment in Nadine's um, decision to try to think about doing things differently. Um, and so the cover, I'm happy with the cover. Um, so I'm not sure if you see, um, if you can sort of relate that last passage to the cover. So the tree is supposed to represent the dying family tree. My, one of my book clubs actually gave me this tree of life um, as a good luck pendant uh, as my book was coming out. So it obviously looks quite sick. And then I'm not sure, not a lot of people can't see it, but it's that optical illusion idea in psychology textbooks that there's two faces here. Um, a lot of people don't see it at all. So there's two, supposed to be two girls' faces and they're divided by the trunk. So that's the meaning of the cover. Um, so Nadine, the first thing she decides to do is to set out her goals for high school. And, and I'm, I think Kareem mentioned this is like a young adult novel. It really straddles the upper middle grade, lower young adult, um, genre, so it really appeals to students for the most part, um, grade 7 to grade 10, so those who are going into high school shortly or recently in high school, although I must say I've had a number of uh, women read the book and they're like, wow, I've never read a young adult, this is really fun. And uh, now that I've started writing it, I've started reading a lot, and it actually is a really fun genre to read. So, you know, Nadine um, comes up with her goals, and they're really the most basic aspirations of a student, you know, if to have fun, to live, not just survive. It's not like she's wanting to be the valedictorian or the head of the school play. They're just pretty basic goals that she has. And what she ends up doing is she um, gives herself a series of small steps. So uh, throughout the novel, you know, another uh, girl starts hanging out in the library, who also, she notices, is sneaking lunch. 
and she's never seen this girl before, and she gives us all the stuff, you know, talk to that girl, you know, and so eventually they're both shy, they, they talk to each other, and then that leads to them actually eating lunch in the cafeteria together, you know, and so that is sort of, um, the whole theme of the novel is social isolation and then trying to overcome it, and um, I've had a lot of, um, I've had a lot, I've had a few students tell me that they actually did the same thing for themselves. They decided to write out steps for themselves. And I think just think, you know, a lot of adults do it, you know, it's called New Year's resolutions, right? Where you kind of decide, what do I want to change this year? And not only do you give yourself goals, but you actually give yourself concrete ways of trying, of trying to get there. And I must say, as an author, um, before I forget, is it became so important for me. I had never really written uh, a novel before, and I needed a framework, personally, um, for me to structure the novel. And the steps sort of became that framework. You know, okay, what is her next step she's going to work on? Okay, that's the step. She's going to accomplish it. Well, that's a chapter, you know? And it, it's kind of funny because, um, and I, I did it very consciously. I, I, I just kind of felt like I'm not sure where I'm going here, and if I have this step process, then I have, I have a map. And uh, anyways, I've thrown away the map now, the second one. But um, people ask me why I did it, and I, and I think that was you know, a lot of it. I wasn't consciously trying to have a path for people to change their lives. It just sort of worked out that way. So the path to writing and publishing. And this is just success or probably anything in life, right? You know, it always seems like it's going to be a straight line, and it, and it, and it never seems to be. So. Um, um, we were speaking at lunch earlier today that I did a history degree instead of an English degree. I was actually asked to do an English degree by an English professor, but I didn't like poetry, so I didn't do an English degree. And then instead of going into journalism, I decided to go to library school, so I did that. And it wasn't a very good fit for me. I'm very disorganized. Um, so it, it's just funny how, you know, you just end up jigging and jagging. Most writers will say, I always wanted to be a writer since I was young, or something I always wanted to do. I never wanted to be a writer. Like, I liked, I loved researching, I loved writing papers, but I never thought, uh, and, then, and I mean writing creatively, I never ever thought I would ever write creatively. And that's how I went to librarianship, because I loved being in libraries, and I loved doing the research. Um, so it, it's just funny how things work out. Um, I have um, four kids, and I have three that are all solidly in their 20s. And then we kind of had a late in life girl who we call Chardonnay. Um, and um, so when she was born, I was reading picture books. We spent a lot of time reading picture books. And uh, I'd taken some time off of work. And I thought, you know what? This is so easy. I could write picture books. You know, this, is, this seems like something I could do. And uh, I signed up. George Brown had these uh, writing for children classes at Mabel's Fables. It's a famous bookstore on Mount Pleasant. It's very close to me Thursday nights. I went out there. You know, going to write these picture books, and I, they're so hard to write. Uh, there's a real brevity in picture books. You have to really nail every single word. And they say that's what you graduate to when you've mastered, you know, writing all the other uh, parts of children's literature. That's what you graduate to. And I tried to start there, it didn't work. Meanwhile, I was attending these classes, and it was full of, you know, middle aged people. And they were, for the most part, writing young adult novels. And we would share all of our stories in a sort of a workshopping situation. And I remember thinking, what is with these people? They're, they're like obsessed with high school. You know, like, why are they writing all these young adult stories? That didn't make any sense to me. I didn't realize that young adult genre was so popular with such a thing. And um, anyways, it's one of those things where, you know, you have a, a, an assignment and you'd have to come up with a middle grade plan or you'd have to come up with the first chapter of a young adult sci-fi fantasy book. And suddenly, you know, the floodgates kind of opened in my brain that I did have some, um, you know, creativity locked in there somewhere. And, um, you know, I just started thinking about stories and, you know, um, and it's, it's one of those things where um, we were talking earlier at lunch today about the subconscious brain and people are like, you know, how, how do you write? And I think so much of writing is just thinking and just letting your subconscious brain sort of mull over things. And then you just have these little mini epiphanies, I find, when you allow your brain just to be unplugged. Um, so much of Nemesis was written um, in my head. Um, 
when I was at church. My husband loves to go to church. I'm not the biggest church goer, but I just go anyways to be supportive. And um, I don't pay attention at all, really. <laughs> and my mind would wander. And I would be like, and I would just come up with like story <coughs> ideas for Nemesis. It was really, it was quite remarkable to me. Um, and then in terms of actually writing the novel, you know, I had a little kid running around. And, you know, if she had a swimming lesson, you know, if I didn't have to go to the water with her, then I would write, you know, a sentence. I'd write a paragraph. Or I would think of some ideas. You know, it, it was very haphazard. Um, anyways, if, if you are interested in writing, I guess my advice is just to go ahead and just try to start writing. Because in the end, it's not about the writing. Corrine saw the first draft of this novel, and I'm sure she, like, threw it in the fireplace. It was <laughs> awful. It was beyond awful. It was written in many different verb tenses. Um, it was very short, actually, but the story was there. And what I didn't realize is that's totally normal. That's what writers do, is they get the story out, and they don't worry about the perfect way to describe a leaf, or they don't worry about, you know, um, the color of someone's hair. Like, they just get the story out. And then you just, you re-edit, and you re-edit, and you re-edit, you re-edit so many times. And honestly, when I read this, I'm still like, oh, you know, I wish I could go back again. So it, it's really not about, the, it's not really the writing process, I think it's the editing process. I like this quote that I saw by J.K. Rowling. Oops, oops, sorry, I feel hockey. Um, <laughs> I think I'm there. Um, I just write what I wanted to write. I write what it uses me. It's totally for myself, and I do feel that, um, you know, as long as you're being entertained by what you're writing, and as long as you think it's interesting, then other people will too. Oops, wow, I'm really, okay, I wanna go for previous. Previous, here we go, okay. So, um, field hockey uh, becomes an important part of the story. Our protagonist, uh, Nadine, meets this girl, Anne, in the library, they talk, um, and suggests that she can't go to uh, meet her at the cafeteria for lunch because there's a field hockey meeting. And she says to Nadine, why don't you come? Why don't you try out? And Nadine's like, oh, you know, no way. You know, and it was all about, I'm afraid I'll make a fool of myself. I'm afraid I won't make the team. I'm afraid I'll suck at it, blah, 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 blah. And then she has this little moment where she's like, you know, everything's about fear. And I was afraid all of grade nine, and it didn't do me any good. So maybe I should just get over myself and just go to the meeting. Um, and so she ends up making the team. And, uh, and, and field hockey just becomes an important part where she you know, meets other people and, and she gains some self-confidence. So um, I like that as well. I was a big, um, you know, I loved, loved sports in high school and I just felt that was really important too. So I'm going to read a little bit, um, another excerpt. And this excerpt happens right after their first field hockey game. So Anne is this transfer student and she happens to have these hot twin brothers, Matt and Cameron. And so Cameron, or sorry, <clears throat> Cameron is the one that Nadine, our protagonist, gets a, gets a crush on, has a crush on. Um, and so Matt picks them up from the game. So it's her other twin brother, Matt, who comes and drives Nadine and Anne home from the game. As I hopped into the back of Matt's car, he stared at me in the rear view mirror. You look familiar, he said. I almost choked on my saliva. Was this guy for real? I had on my elegant team uniform. Well, I said as tactfully as I could, I go to your school. Oh yeah, of course, he said. He shook his head and then a few moments later said, I know you from somewhere else. What's your name? Sorry, Matt, this is Nadine, said Anne. She's on the team. Nadine, this is Matt, my brother. And what's your last name, asked Matt as he squinted. It's Stuart, Nadine Stewart, I said and decided that any further elaboration might confuse him. Oh, you have a sister, Chelsea, right? No, but I have a sister, Rachel, I added slowly, just to help him out. She's in your grade. <laughs> right, you're Rachel's sister. He turned to look back at me with a victorious smile, and I nodded, lest there be any further confusion. Yeah, she pointed you out. She told me you were on the team, that you were playing with Mouse here. Matt again made eye contact contact in the mirror. She's nice, your sister. Anne turned to me and gave me a big smile. She was clearly happy that her family had her brother's seal of approval. I wasn't surprised that Rachel was described as nice, and I wouldn't have been shocked to hear if she was into, say, quantum chemistry. Rachel could be whoever she wanted to be. It was pretty obvious to me that she'd used my spot on the team to ingratiate herself with Matt. Like I said, she was cunning. 
Does Rachel play? It's a great sport. Matt fondly put his arm on Anne's shoulder. She's only played for a couple of seasons, but you'd never know, she's a pro. Uh, no, uh, actually, Rachel doesn't play field hockey. I never played it either. I thought playing ice hockey might help, you know, but it turns out not so much. Although I was on the verge of saying that Rachel sucked at sports and hated doing anything that made her sweat, I held my tongue. The last thing I needed was for Rachel to hear I'd said anything remotely negative to dreamy Matt. Oh, I know where you live then, said Matt, to my surprise, that Rachel was cool as a cucumber. She had never mentioned Matt's name at home, but I knew how she operated, and clearly there was something potentially happening. I'm going to have to watch that girl more closely, I thought, as we spun around the last curb and screeched up the driveway. Thanks for the ride, I said, slamming the door. Matt nodded and called out, say hi to Rach. Will do, I replied, before he backed up and sped off. I dropped my stick and bag in the front hall, kicked off my cleats and hightailed it to the fridge. All I could think of was drinking a big glass of orange juice. I was in my field hockey uniform, standing by the fridge, filling up, with, filling up the OJ with ice when Rachel burst into the kitchen. Matt dropped you off and you didn't text me a heads up? I didn't think of it, I said, taken aback. Yeah, you didn't think. By the time I got his text, it was too late. He was just doing a favor, I started. Duh, it's called an opportunity lost. I would have made up an excuse to see him. I like the guy. Don't you get that? Or are you up to something? Like trying to keep him for yourself. What? That's ridiculous. Is it? Rachel pulled a face and glared at me for a sec, considering. Then she arched her left eyebrow and started coughing a bit, you know, like she was clearing her throat. Ooh, there's something really gross in that glass. Hand it over, she said, as she grabbed it out of my head. To my horror, she then proceeded to hork a huge, disgusting phlegm blob into the OJ. The blob landed on top of an ice cube and twirled around the glass like polar bear snot on an ice floe. <laughs> Drink up, it's brain food, she said with a fake sweet smile as she thrust the glass towards me. I refuse to take it back. You're called, but you better think harder next time, said Rachel. Before I completely lost it, I conjured up my step for inner calm. Focus on the breathing, cleansing breath in, stale air out. I dumped the glass and watched the blob swirl around the drain before it disappeared. I wiped down the counter and I ransacked the fridge, but couldn't find anything else to drink. So I poured myself tap water in a different glass. I stood sipping while my mind immediately wandered to step six, visualizing Rachel's funeral step. <laughs> Again, Rachel was old and dead and laid out in a casket. I leaned over her, and everyone would assume that I was going to give her my final sisterly kiss. But instead, just before the casket lid fell, fell shut, I horked a huge one onto her face. <laughs> Man, I was getting good at step six. So, not only does Nadine give herself steps, like talk to this person, try to go to the field hockey meeting, she also gives herself steps to not thrust and throttle her sister. So one of the things she does is she has this breathing, so she teaches herself to meditate. And then I thought it was fun for her just to visualize her sister's funeral. So this, this happens throughout the novel where she, her sister will do something awful to her and um, Nadine just goes right to that funeral and, and she kind of exacts her revenge. It's a little sick and twisted, but I had a lot of fun. <laughs> One thing I didn't know when I was writing Nemesis is, you know, sibling rivalries, bitter out since the beginning of time, there's always been Cain and Abel, but that um, sibling bullying is actually more common than school year bullying. And um, I think the reason I managed to get Nemesis published, because there's a lot of books on bullying out there, and it's a sort of a crowded field, is that there was not much on sibling bullying. And um, since I've actually completed the book, I actually kind of went on and did a bit of research. And 50% of children are involved in sibling bullying in their home. And um, they revealed that children who have been bullied are twice as likely to report being clinically depressed as adults. So it's actually a very, uh, profound thing, sibling bullying. Um, and that nationwide, it's the most common form of family violence. So there you go. Like, I, I didn't realize this before I wrote the book, but it was a little bit shocking um, to see that. Story ideas, where do they come from? 
And uh, you know, as I mentioned before, that you know, I had the whole sister dynamic. That was sort of an inspiration. You know, we did our two older sisters tended to kind of bully themselves, and uh, Corinne and I were kind of the ones who just tried to stay in the line of fire. Um, but you know, certainly my own experience growing up was a bit of an inspiration for it. Um, and there's, you know, mental illness is definitely a part of this novel as well, and it's not spelled out overtly. Um, Rachel has always sort of had a tendency to bullying, has always been slightly moody, but as you read the story, you know, you begin to see uh, there's a bit of a roller coaster there. Well, she'll be this amazing sister, super fun and totally up, and then she'll kind of crash. And um, I had a really close friend um, that I knew since kindergarten, and when we got to high school, you know, she just would be the life of the party, or she would be awful, and she'd be awful to her close friends. So she could she could feel comfortable enough being pretty awful to me at times. And um, anyways, you know, by the end of high school, I just distanced myself from her, and I have not spoken to her since. And it wasn't until I got to university and I took psychology 101 that I'm pretty sure she suffered from bipolar disease. And if you read Nemesis, I think. You know, you'll see that there's something more going on than just bullying. That there's um, there's a pattern. There's a pattern of severe moodiness, and um, I just you know, I guess because when I was in high school and I had somebody exhibiting signs of early stage bipolar disease right in front of my eyes, and I didn't see it, you know, and and so I kind of wanted to add that as part of the story um, because I thought that might be helpful for people. So. And again, you can sort of take the story without it. Some people are like, wow, she's really out of control. But, you know, I, I'm hoping that, I think the younger audience <coughs> may not always see it, but I'm hoping that the older people do see that. Uh, another thing is that the twin brothers were so different. We actually knew twin brothers. One was tall and blonde and kind of a renaissance man. The other one was more like Matt. He was really athletic and sporty and dark. And so, you know, again, I kind of had that idea from my personal experience. But theft, you know, I, is a great way to get ideas. Um, and the reason I included field hockey is I was at a party with some friends and included younger children too, and my friend's daughter was playing field hockey. And I was kind of thinking about Nemesis. It was, I thought, actually I had it called something else before, and then it became field day, and then it became Nemesis. And um, I was saying, so like, I'm thinking of maybe field hockey for a book I'm writing, like, and she's like, oh. I'll tell you what happened on the field at this game. And she told me this crazy story. I don't know if anybody has read the book, but the story that appears in the Nemesis is basically verbatim what happened on the field. And the editor actually asked me to modify that passage. He thought that it was too extreme, it was too unbelievable. And, um, and it actually was true. The only, you know, probably one or two of the only real things that happened were because I just stole this idea. And, and, and the whole book kind of, it was a really important part of the book. So I changed things around and, and I just had to make that a pivotal thing. Um, imagination, we talked about that. It, it's just the sort of thing that, you know, you just really have to give your brain unplugged time to actually be creative. <coughs> Uh, and, you know, read. Um, I'm now writing a middle grade book, and the best way to prepare for writing a middle grade book is to read middle grade books. So I'm doing that. Um, the stall who can listen, I know um, our teacher at Maple's Fables used to say, like, go to Starbucks and sit there and listen to everyone's conversations. That's a great way to get story ideas. Or see a table at Starbucks and, and decide, how do these people know each other? What are they talking about? You know, there's all kinds of fun exercises you can do um, to hone your ideas. Um, and attend a drama class. But you know what I didn't realize, and it didn't really happen so much in Nemesis, because I think the protagonist is similar to me in some respects, um, is that you really have to inhabit your characters. And I found that, especially in my second novel, <coughs> that you, know, you may have an idea of who your main character is, and you've got them, and you have an idea where the story's going, but then you add some other secondary characters, and they start talking, and suddenly one of your secondary characters says something, and you're like, oh, that's perfect. <coughs> I never saw this coming, and now I've got to go all off on this way. So um, I didn't realize how important it is to really inhabit your characters, 
And um, one of my favorite young adult authors, who's her, I can never remember the order of her last name, is either Danielle Ullman Young or Danielle Young Ullman. She's written a brilliant book called Everything Beautiful is Not Ruined. Like, I highly recommend it. And she is an actress. And, um, and I, I started to attend a few of these pub nights. I'm shocked at the number of writers who their day job is to be an actor, you know, because it, it, it's important. It's an important skill. Why be a writer? God, you call the shots. You get to name the characters. You get to um, describe them. Uh, you get to decide if the ending's going to be happy or sad. And it's free. The only cost is a pen and a piece of paper. And it's a great way to write, is just to have a pen and a paper. And, um, you know, and then once you've finished, then you can go onto your computer and then you've just edited it once already. You know, so it's, it's, it's a free thing as opposed to scuba diving or, or taking um, drum lessons. And just like reading, you know, you get to live so many other lives and escape to another one. It's, it's wonderful. Oops, it's about time, hey? Um, if, are there any questions? I, I'm just going to put up one last slide. I can't help it. This is, um, this is Emma Donahue. Um, and I love this quote. You know, there's a big debate about writers. What's the most important part, the beginning or the end? And, uh, and I know for both Nemesis and the second novel that I'm finished, it took me forever to write the end. I had everything done except for the end. And it would take me months before I could actually write the end. I find it a very difficult um, last part of the puzzle to put together. And I, and I totally agree with her that um, you know, you'll leave the reader singing or satisfied or seething, depending on how you end it. And people keep saying to me, I should write a sequel called Nemabro, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is, but I actually had somebody tweet to me last week to say, you really should write a sequel. You know, because I don't really tackle the mental health thing directly, but it's leading up to that, that, that Rachel does need some help. And she said, you should write a sequel about what happens after that. And I, and I actually, I kept thinking, no, no, no. But now I'm thinking, maybe, you never know. So, any questions at all? Sure. I see that you chose to write it from the first person perspective. Yes. Was that a decision you made early on and stuck with? Or is that something that you played with with the drafts or anything? And why did you choose that? Yeah, you know, um, I just gravitate to the first person perspective. Um, and I think with Nadine, it naturally worked for me because, as I say, she's not me at all, but I do felt like I, I kind of knew her headspace pretty well. What I didn't realize is that in the young adult genre, it's actually preferred that you write in the first person point of view. Because for young adult readers, they like to make that instant emotional connection with the narrator or the protagonist. And, um, and also, um, I'm a big fan of coming of age stories. Uh, Nemesis is a coming of age story. The other novel I've finished is a coming of age story. And, and, and you can like firsthand see all the different shifts, like the slow, subtle changes that happen in a first person narrative. You see Nadine getting a little bit more confidence along the way. I think it's just more impactful. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. What's your second uh, book about? Because you said it was for a younger... Okay, okay, so my third book is for middle grade. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, my second book that I just... It's on submission right now, and I don't have an elevator pitch, but I'll try and read to you very briefly what it's about. Um, it's called Pond and Prejudice. Um, parachuted from Toronto into a small northern town, following her granddad's, granddad's mysterious disappearance, Vintage aficionado and budding biologist Josie is dismayed to be at Highland Tree Farm, where her granddad's absence is palpable. The bugs are epic and the locals are loose-lipped. When the investigation into granddad's disappearance stalls, Josie channels her inner Nancy Drew, fingering local golf course owner Bob, who is pulling out all the stops, including romancing her mom Ellie, to purchase the pond and surrounding forest. But proving Bob's guilt means unraveling the ecology issues surrounding the proposed real estate deal and ruffling the feathers of the poison-tongued local mother-daughter mo mother duo, Amber and Ashley. But the clock is ticking, and Josie must discover the truth and ultimately solve the, mysterious, the mystery of her granddad's disappearance before her mother and Bob seal the deal. It's too long to be known here, but I'm, it, it's, it's really hard to do. I'm working on it. Yeah. So that's what I, I, I finished that one. So that's an ad. 
That's it's a young adult book. Oh, that's a young adult. Yeah, so, you know, as I was mentioning to a few people before, Nemesis kind of straddles the upper middle grade, lower young adult book, and it's kind of a no man's land. Now that I've written one, I wouldn't recommend that. I think it's hard for people to sell that book because it can be an elementary school library, but really grades six to seven, eight should read it, but maybe not the younger ones. And then in high school, the nines and tens like it, but not the 11 and 12 so much because it's not as edgy or as racy. Um, and so um, Pond and Prejudice is young adult, the first person point of view of Josie, this girl from the city who is parachuted into the small northern town. Um, and then I'm working on another one right now. It's sort of early stages, um, about two thirds through the first very rough draft. And it's middle grade, so it's, uh, yeah. But there's, I know at chapters, like I, my granddaughter's just turned 12, so yeah. she's in grade six. Yeah. And I go to chapters with her, and um, there is, it is, there is a, ch a big challenge in getting that, say, grade five to grade eight, kind of, yeah. to find something that's appropriate, that's not too sexy, or, you know, I'm not, and then even my daughter, my granddaughter likes those animated, Novels. Yes, so yeah. Yeah, but um, you know, it's still, it's really challenging to, to find something that's, uh, that she likes. Yeah, and, and she, she likes dark. Yeah, and you know what? <laughs> my, my daughter is in grade five now, and this book came out when she was in grade four, and half her class just devoured it and really enjoyed it. And I told my daughter she's not old enough to read it yet. Mm -hmm. and, and I did have one mother who's, um, who's a teacher, and she she read a little bit of it, and it's about that funeral, that whole, and she just, that's so inappropriate. Children should not be reading that. And so she got, she, so you know, it, it's kind of hard sometimes to say what is an appropriate age. Five There's, nights at Friday's, come on. Mm -hmm. You know what? Like, like hello. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of holding off because I want my daughter just to be in grade six or older when she reads yeah. it. Because I think she'll enjoy it the most then. Mm -hmm. So that's part of why I've, I've done it. But yeah, I, I do, like, I'm speaking to a seven and eight class tomorrow, and I find that that's really the perfect age mm -hmm. for, the, for the novel. Yes. How did you find the process of publishing and finding a publisher and everything that was Oh my goodness. And, and you know what, that was that whole squiggly line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of got, I thought I got really lucky because after I, Corrine helped me polish it off and make it somewhat presentable, I sent it to a publisher, a decent sized Canadian publisher, and I got a, a response right away. They really liked the first three chapters, send the rest. So I'm like, wow, I sent the rest, I waited two months, I sent them an email, they're like, love it. And I'm like, wow, this this isn't what you read about. And she said, I make the acquisition decisions, and you know, we have a meeting in December, and so like, you're probably good to go. So then in November, I get an email. Oh, we have a new editor starting in January. Blah 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 blah. Long story short, it got cut. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm actually glad it did because I then rewrote it probably two or three more times. It's probably a better book than it was. I may have come out, and I may have not been very happy with it. Um, and so then once that fell through, and I did rewrite it another time, I sent it off to another publisher, and again, really liked the book, um, think we're gonna publish this, they went bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> then I decided myself to uh, send it to Kirkus. You know, I actually paid like money to send it to Kirkus Reviews, they're a very reputable reviewer, because I thought, you know what, maybe this isn't any good. Like maybe I'm just wasting my time, and I got surprisingly a good review. I, I was very surprised, I got a very good review. And so then um, that kind of helped a little bit, um, but lucky for, the, for me, the editor of the press that went bankrupt started freelancing for this publisher. And so he reached out to me and said, hey, I've told them about your book, and I really think it'd be a good fit. I did submit with, you know, to them, and they did publish it, and it's all been great. Um, I like them, they're wonderful, and uh, so we'll just kind of see what happens with that. So, yeah. When you mentioned schools, I, I was wondering if you have thought of presenting at a PD session for a school board. Uh, they yeah. happen regularly, like every month or so, like Toronto, London, like every city has them. Yeah, you know what, I, I, I'm not that familiar with how to open the door. I can talk to you after. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. You know, I, I, um, I'm going to speak with Emily Carr. I've never spoken to a school in London. I've spoken to a couple in Toronto, but more that I had connections with. And as I say, like I, the students do seem to resonate it with it. And I do love, you know, to me, the big takeaway is that, you know, if you're not in a great place, that you can take concrete steps, small steps, and, and you can make things better. You know, if you're willing to put yourself out there a little bit, I think it's a good takeaway. And um, so, yeah, I'm happy to. I'm, I'm open to anything. 
because all the PD sessions is all the teachers. I've, yeah. I've been to one before and after. You can actually purchase the book, or hopefully teachers will decide to use that novel in their class, and then you have. Yeah, and I got. Um, I was at the OLA uh, Ontario Library Association conference. Um, a couple weeks ago and I gave out some free copies and I just had a librarian send me a message on Twitter just a few days ago to say I love the book, I'm going to share it with my high school. And when you hear that, it's like, wow, that's so great. You know, you work so hard on something and then you kind of feel like it's hard. You know, it's a, it's, I'm a first time writer, it's a small indie publisher, you know, it's just, it's not going to happen overnight, but, you know, I hope it happens a little bit more than it is. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Sure. Just about the issue of um, sibling bullying that yeah. you said. Um, did that thing, did you wish you had done the research, because you said you found the, oh, the research that they shared with us on the screen after you would written the yeah. book. Yeah. Do you think knowing that beforehand would have changed the way that you written the book? Or um, no? That's a good question. You know, I'm not really sure. You know, um, this, the, you know, the, the protagonist needs help and she's afraid to seek help with her mother because her mother is just barely standing up, you know, and then when her mother finally is able to stand up, she's getting a real estate license and working full time and, and, and she just doesn't want to rock the boat, you know, so yeah, she should get some help and maybe <coughs> I, I, I would have done something a little bit differently, perhaps maybe she would have spoken to a guidance counselor or something, but I guess the idea is, is that the ab abuse sort of takes place behind closed doors. And most of it is silly things like horking in a glass of orange juice. You know, it does, it does escalate a little bit, and it, but it's humiliating for Nadine. And, um, you know, that's, that's difficult to deal with. But yeah, that's The reason that's I asked was because sure. I know in, in the review, Curtis, yeah. Yeah. one of the things that they praised about the book was that it was not preaching, mm -hmm. that it dealt with these issues in a very realistic but not heavy-handed way. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking maybe if you had all that research, it might have ended up being a little more heavy-handed, where you might have mm -hmm. felt this responsibility to pass on this knowledge about these statistics and those sort of things that build in the book, where it was already in there in a very yeah. accessible way for a reader. Yeah, and you know, there's many different instances of bullying in the book. There's cyberbullying, there's bullying amongst the teammates, there's bullying against other field hockey teams, and, I, and like, there's no one answer to any of this. And um, I do know that at one point somebody gets quite hurt and because they missed an opportunity to talk to an adult, to let somebody on staff know there was an issue. And I, so I kind of felt that said something, you know. Um, I, I know for Nadine, her worst fear is to be humiliated in public. So that's kind of why she puts up with it in private. And she's just terrified that something is gonna happen at school when she's just trying to make some social strides. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question? I was actually <laughs> just going to say the exact same thing as Callum. Again. Great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, but I am... And I agree with you too. I, I, thought, so I actually thought the same thing, because I read the review. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I, I, they asked me, oh, what little symbol do you want to have in your book? And um, I, I am a big believer in sisters. You know, Corinne and I are very close. I have um, one other living sister that I'm very close with too. And I, and I just thought, you know what? I, I, despite all this, like nemesis, you know, your sis as your foe. I am a big believer in the sisterhood, and so I did want that to be the Celtic symbol for sisterhood to be there because you know sisters are uh, love or hate. You know, they, they you know, a, there's a reason why you're as close as a sister is a phrase that's used widely. And I would suggest, even though there is abuse, that they still, she still loves her sister. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like it doesn't matter. It, yeah. it matters, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, the love is still there. It's just that you, you have to work harder. To work, you go beyond that um, mental health problem. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you hate your sister. Yeah. You hate what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I and I think in the end, you know, Rachel is quite jealous of her sister, you know, because she does see her sister turning her life around. Mm -hmm. And she's always liked it because she was the, you know, the hot girl on campus and her sister was a nobody. And, uh, and so, the, you know, the higher Nadine tries to strive for, she's not trying to strive for anything, she's just trying to have a basic, happy life. You know, her sister sees it as a threat to her, sort of. And that's, I think, a lot of the dynamic that isn't overt to the younger sister. Mm -hmm. 
until the older sister, you know, they have this big talk at the end and it, you know, there are some things, you know, but it, it's, yeah, I won't give too much away. Save it for the sequel. Save it for the sequel, right, Nemo bro. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're just about out of time, so I'll say thank you on behalf of everyone who's here. You should know that the bookstore was supposed to be here, and I double-checked, and they were supposed to be here. So there are copies of your book on campus. You could get them in the bookstore if you wanted to. Um, that's too bad that she wasn't yeah. here. Well, actually, you know what? I, I, I People have their own plans or whatever, but somebody had given me money to pick up a copy, so maybe we'll just go right away mm -hmm. and do that. And so if you wanted it signed and you were you had a you know an extra 10 minutes to come with us, we might as well do that. All right. And Sounds good. just as an FYI, not that I'm trying to undercook the bookstore, but I'm going to be at Mason Hill tomorrow from 4 to 6.30. And if you happen to be at the mall, come and say hello because right. at the Coles, because it can get kind of boring. You know, just <laughs> two and a half hours. This is an aside. Right. Okay. And thank you so much for having me. It, um, it's great to be in London, you know, where they're all set, and be here at Fanshawe and to speak to all of you. You're a great audience. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.